hardened unthankfulness, division, hatred, anger. Where is God in all this? Is he watching? Is he seeing? Does he know? Hardened ungratefulness, chaos defining our new norm, protests, debates, arguments, violence. Where is truth? Is it another war, scandal, a senseless attack on innocence? Have we become heartless to the hurt, the sick, the oppressed? Confusion is constant and rest is rare. Is this life right now? See, God never promised an effortless life. He promised to never leave us or forsake us. He promised to be faithful even when we are not. He promised to be our refuge and our strength. In turbulent times, God's grace still abounds. His mercies new every morning. Jesus still died for us. Salvation is still free and heaven still awaits. Today, choose thankfulness. Good morning, welcome to Twickenham. We're glad to have you here this morning. That's good news right there. I don't care what you're going through, I don't care what's going on in your life these days, whether it's all good or a lot of struggle. Jesus still died for us and heaven still awaits for us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, you can. All right. Even if your team lost yesterday, you can say amen to that, right? So, hey, if you're a guest this morning, thanks for coming out to be with us at Twickenham. We are really glad you were here. Had a, we had a really great weekend. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that later on this morning. But it's been a very busy weekend for our church, a really good weekend. A lot of good things happened. And so we're just glad you're here to be a part of it. Hey, we want to welcome a couple of new members this morning. Uh, Matt and Kelly Young and their daughter Kathleen is down in children's worship right now. But Matt and Kelly are right up here in the balcony. <laughs> See, the bal balcony's growing faster than you are down here. So <laughs> we're going to step it up, balcony people. All right. So. If you're looking for a church home, we would love to talk with you about how we welcome new members. You may have questions about uh, how we do things or what we believe. We'd be, love to sit down and talk with you about that. And we'd like to hear where God is taking you, how the journey has been going for you. We're going to continue our series this morning on uh, the problem. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? It's a, a, an issue that we just deal with. I mean, every week there seems to be some news about some struggle that people are having. But I love the way that video framed things just a second ago. Even though there, there are hard things going on, we can still find ways and reasons to be grateful and thankful for what God is doing. In just a second, we're going to sing this song. It's uh, number four in the blue book, All the Earth. I want you to listen to how this starts. Father, into your courts I will enter, maker of heaven and earth, I tremble in your holy presence, glory, glory in your sanctuary. That's where we are every single day, not just on Sundays, but every single day we are in a sanctuary of glory because of who God is, what God has done, and what awaits us. We're going to take our uh, contribution up as we sing this song, and then we'll stand after that. So glad you're here. Let's praise the Lord together. Father, into your courts I will
finish reading, if you would, at the appropriate times from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, sun and moon, praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, highest heavens, in waters above the stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at His command they were created. And He established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and birds. Kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth. Young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Pray. Mm-hmm.
I've appreciated Lee and Todd's thoughts from communion the last two weeks and for the series that Jody has been speaking to us related on evil in this world. It's because of this fallen world and the sin that saturates it that we all experience the consequences in some manner. One of those consequences is death at some point. Now I would imagine that most everybody in this auditorium has been touched by death and it seems like we hear of tragic events involving death almost every day now in the news. Both of my grandfathers passed before I was born. My mom and dad both worked and a couple named Betty and John Smith kept me, helped raise me, shaped me, and cared for me while mom and dad worked. Betty was Nana and John was Pawpaw. And without a grandfather of my own, I immediately allowed Pawpaw to be that for me. And his own grandkids would tell me that he treated me just like one of them, and quite jealously, one said, even better. <laughs> when I was about seven, I can still remember mom taking the call of his passing, and my world exploded. It was my first real experience with death, and it hurt, and I did not understand it. Soon after, my mom's mother, Lucille Falkenberry, would pass away, and while I wasn't incredibly close to her, as a youth, it was still an incredible mystery to me as to why death comes to those that we love. Several years later, when I was in seventh grade, one of my schoolmates' name was Leonard Silly. His family helped care for the Huntsville Country Club. There was an accident with a tractor one day, and Leonard lost his life. <clears throat> Several of us were asked to be pallbearers, and again, our world was rocked. This death thing just didn't make sense, and it hurt. As I aged and I matured, I learned all the right answers about death. Now, it's one thing to have head knowledge. It's another thing to have real life experiences. And I really never came to grips with that until about the year 2000 when I learned that my mother had been <clears throat> diagnosed with, with a cancer called multiple myeloma. With no treatment, she had six months at best. With treatment, possibly five to seven years, she survived two and a half. It was during those two and a half years though, on six hour drives to and from Little Rock, that we discussed a lot. There are things that become incredibly important. <clears throat> there are things that become incredibly important when death knocks at your door. And you know that your time on earth is running out more rapidly than you had planned. This was easy when I read it earlier. <laughs> one of the things we discussed was death. And I remember asking her one day as we sat in the hotel room, we were done with the doctor appointments for that day and waiting for the doctor appointments for the next day as she was preparing for a stem cell, cell transplant if she was ready for death. I should have known the answer. I really should have. Because this was the lady in my youth. Uh, if you lived in Huntsville a long time, you know that every now and then we have outbreaks of tornadoes all over the place. And it was one of those nights when there was a tornado warning, then there wasn't one, and there was another one, and there wasn't one, and it was coming, and it never came, and it was coming again. And finally, she got so frustrated with it, she said, I'm going to bed. If the Lord wants to take Nancy Trigger to heaven tonight by tornado, then so be it. So we went to bed. Um, but she told me in that hotel room she was good spiritually. And if God was ready for her to go home, then she was ready to go. As a result of those conversations, all those right answers about death that I had studied about and learned began to make sense. Dealing with cancer became less anxious. It became less fearful. Since for the Christian, death is not the end. It's really just the beginning. My mom taught me a lot as she faced death. It's hard to understand why certain people go through certain trials, through certain seasons of storm in their lives. I didn't understand it as my mom went through it, but after her passing, two of her very best friends who also succumbed to cancer told me on their deathbeds that, that facing death was easier because of the example that my mom had set. I lost my grandmother in 2001, Mom in 2003, uh, my dad in 2013, and my sister in 2015 to a tragic death. All those deaths hurt emotionally, and I cried, but from a spiritual standpoint, all those folks entered into a rest that we should be thinking about, that we should be preparing for. My early views of death were more like, why is this happening? Why is this person, why is God allowing this? 
It was a selfish, self-focused desire to keep all that I loved here on earth. I came to realize through study and through experience that, that this earth is not home. It is a fallen, broken place because of sin. Death frees us from that and takes us to a place where the hurt and the sin and all the tragedy are gone. For Christian, the death brings us into the presence of God, and as bad as we want our loved ones back, I can guarantee you they don't want to be back. While we're shaking our heads in disbelief, they're raising their hands in praise. But to come to grips with that and these types of losses takes a different perspective and one that the world does not understand. God is in control. And there are times when we cannot trace his hand when we attempt to understand why things happen and it's in those seasons that we simply have to trust. It's often hard to see, much less understand the whole picture as finite beings. But God has always had a plan, especially as it related to death, and that plan was Jesus. He left heaven, took on the form of a human, lived sinlessly, and then had to die a horrific death. Why? Simply because he loved us. Because he wanted to save us from the sin in this world, and because he didn't want us to fear death, but to long for the day that we would be with him. He told his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms that were not so I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and take you so that you can be where I am. You know the way and the place where I'm going. He told Martha at Lazarus' death, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Paul would sum it up this way. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what we see is temporary, what, we, what is unseen is eternal. I miss my mom and dad. I miss my sister, even though we did not see eye to eye on many things. But I do not grieve as those with no hope because of Christ's death and resurrection. And because of his sacrifice, my hope is not in the things of this world, but in an eternity with him. So today, like all Sundays, we pause to remember the sacrifice that gives us that hope. Would you pray with me? God, we um, pause this morning to take communion, to remember the gift that you gave us in your son for his willingness to leave heaven, to come to earth, to sacrifice for us so that we could be made righteous in God's sight, so that we can have hope for eternity in heaven. God, as we break this bread, as we take this, help us to remember Christ's broken body on the cross and the sacrifice that he made for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's pray. God, it seems that we hear about death in some form uh, in the news or in our lives every day of the week. God, we're thankful for Jesus' sacrifice. We are thankful that he conquered death. God, we're thankful that we do not have to fear that. And we long for the day uh, that, that we will meet you again, that we will be caught up in the air, and that we'll spend eternity with you. Till then, help us to encourage each other with memories and thoughts of what Christ did for us. And as we take this juice, help us to remember uh, the blood that was shed for us that washes us clean of our sins and helps us to be righteous in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree, his body bound and drenched in tears. They Messiah. 
so many of you will remember exactly where you were and what you were doing and who you were with. 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday, November 15th, 1989, an F4 tornado cut an 18-mile long, half-mile wide swath of destruction from the arsenal across the municipal golf course, up Airport Road, all the way to Killingsworth Cove Branch, 10 miles north of Gurley. 21 people were killed, 12 of them while sitting in traffic on Airport Road between Memorial and Whitesburg Drive, and some of you knew some of them. 259 homes were destroyed, many more damaged. Over 100 businesses, three churches and two schools were damaged or completely demolished. Estimates were placed in terms of costs around $100 million, and that was 1989. When we, when we talk about the problem of pain and evil and suffering in the world, we're not engaging in just some philosophic debate, speculation. We're talking about real people experiencing real pain. And so for the last several weeks, we've been trying to deal really honestly with a common question that, that skeptics ask believers and that we ask ourselves, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? And I hope this hasn't come across as kind of a maudlin season for us, because it's not. It's just real. It's reality. And we have to deal with it. And we have to deal with it from, from our worldview, from a Christian perspective. So last week, we wrestled with what philosophers call the problem of moral evil. Evil that results from the choices that people make. We, we followed the reasoning of a Christian apologist named Alvin Plantinga. It's not permissible. It is not permissible. For an all-knowing, all-good, all-powerful God to permit evil unless he has a morally sufficient reason for doing so. And the question we explored last week was, does God have a morally sufficient reason? Well, I think so. He dignified human beings by creating us as free moral agents. We have complete freedom to make choices uh, to determine our own way and how we're going to live. And our choices, though, have consequences, and sometimes those consequences are often very, very far-reaching. Um, so much of the evil that we see in the world is not from the hand of God, but from the minds of men and women who made choices. God could have dropped, we talked about this last week, God could have dropped us into a matrix-like world where all the outcomes are predetermined and where we don't have the freedom to choose, but he had a morally higher responsibility to create us with the most robust free will possible. Now, that's just a quick summary of last week. If you didn't uh, hear that, you can go online and, and uh, listen to last week and the week before, and I would encourage you to do that because these three lessons sort of work together. But here's the thing for today. What about all the bad things that are not the result of human choices. What philosophers call the problem of natural evil. Tornadoes, like the one that hit Huntsville in 1989, are morally neutral. That tornado didn't wake up that morning and say, you know what, I think I'm gonna wreak some havoc in Huntsville today. Hurricanes are not caused by human sin unless the folks in the environmental anxiety industry are correct, right? So regardless of your position on anthropogenic climate change, earthquakes happen whether we're righteous or unrighteous. So here's the question, how could a good and knowing and powerful God permit such tragedies? Now, I, I, I keep telling you this, but this is not a new question. It's an old one. On November 1st, 1755, a magnitude 9 earthquake shook the western shores of Europe. It was one of the most devastating earthquakes 
in history, killing between 60,000 and 100,000 people. The quake was followed by a tsunami that destroyed most, most of the Portuguese city of Lisbon, the, then the fourth largest city in Europe, and then the rest of Lisbon, including a major center for Jesuit studies and, and all of the cathedrals in town, were destroyed by the fires that followed the earthquake and the tsunami. After the Great Lisbon Earthquake, and that's what it's called, the Great Lisbon Earthquake, the problem of natural evil became a huge topic of debate. You ever heard of Voltaire? Voltaire was a, a philosopher at the time. He wrote a satirical novel titled Candide, and the novel is about the problem of natural evil evil. Until that point, natural disasters had been considered a result of God's wrath. But in Lisbon, the cathedrals were all destroyed and on a, on a holy day. So that explanation no longer functioned well for them. People began to ask more and more, why does God permit such terrible things to happen? And, and we've been asking the question ever since. If unwelcome consequences follow ungodly choices, we get it. That kind of makes sense, right? What we don't understand is why God would allow innocent people to die in natural disasters that are not in any way influenced by the choices people make. And doesn't it always seem that, that the most innocent are the ones who are most hurt when disasters happen? Children? Long before Lisbon, Augustine, another great Christian philosopher, offered that natural disasters were, in fact, the result of free will. It just wasn't the free will of human beings. He blamed it all on demons, fallen angels, or the devil himself. In his view, there was no such thing as natural evil. It was all supernatural, that the devil was behind every tornado and earthquake and all the other bad stuff, and, and a lot of people still believe that. And it would move us toward a comfortable answer, but Augustine's position doesn't really fit well with Scripture. Because in the Bible, it's not Satan who's said to be in control of the cosmos. It's God. And that's kind of what we've been singing all morning. That, that scripture leading that Lincoln read us, uh, led us in, and then praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. All of those songs are about God being in charge. Job chapter 38, verses 34 and 35, God asks Job, can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you and say, here we are? And Job has to go, no, I really can't. And the implication is that God is the one who orders the rain and dispatches the lightning. Genesis says that God sent the flood that floated Noah's boat, but it also wiped out the rest of humanity. First Kings says that God stopped the rain from falling on wicked King Ahab's crops, but he started it again when the righteous prophet Elijah, Elijah prayed. The Gospels tell us that Jesus walked on water, that he stilled the storm, that he even cursed a fig tree and made it die. So what do we do with all of that? Do these passages teach that God is in constant control of geoatmospheric phenomena? Does, if God really does micromanage the planet, then that deadly Enterprise Alabama tornado in March 2007 is on God. So is the 2004 Christmas tsunami in Thailand. Quarter, a quarter million people in 14 countries were killed. The 192 hurricanes that have hit the American shorelines east and south since 1900 are all on God. But it, if God's finger spun up all those storms, you can't argue that he lacks power, but it gets kind of hard to defend another thing the Bible says about him, and that's his loving kindness. So does Scripture teach that God is constantly pulling climate levers and pushing weather buttons? Well, when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, 
He challenged him to reconstitute stones into bread. Now, if you could take a stone and turn it into a loaf of bread, that would demonstrate a significant level of mastery over matter. But Jesus refused. He did, however, turn water into wine. And then Satan tempted Jesus to defy gravity. But again, he refused. After the resurrection, though, his disciples witnessed his unassisted ascent into the heavens. Jesus healed only a small percentage of the, of the sick that he came in contact with. He stilled only one storm, and as far as we know, he never once interrupted the regularly scheduled arrivals of sunrise and sunset. So scripture does not claim that God is a control freak when it comes to nature. He occasionally violates the laws of nature, but for the most part, God refuses to tinker with the predictability of the order he created. So let's ask a deeper question. Could God have created a world free of natural disasters? Now, if you're a believer, your first response is, well, yeah, there's, God can do anything. But again, Scripture kind of pushes back against that. Hebrews chapter 6 says that God can't lie. James said that he can't be tempted by evil. And then there are those philosophical brain twisters. Could God create a two-sided triangle? Could God create a, could God create a square circle? Could God create a, a stone he couldn't lift? Those questions are, are examples of something called flawed reasoning called a, a category mistake in which a property is ascribed to a thing that could not possibly possess that property. It would be like you asking me, what's your daughter's name? I don't have a daughter, so I can't very well name her. I've got two amazing daughters-in-law, Jessica and Katie, but I don't have a daughter. If I had a daughter, I could tell you what I would have named her. I would have named her Augusta, Georgia. That would have been the name. <laughs> I would have named her that. My wife, not so much, right? Savannah, Georgia, maybe. The point is, God can't do a thing that is logically impossible. So let's go back to the question, could God have created a world free of natural disasters? If that's not one of those category mistakes, one of those logical impossible ideas, if it were possible, then, then the planet would look very, very different from the one we inhabit. Now, it's always dangerous for me to start talking science to you, okay? Because I'm not, and a handful of you are. You're astrophysicists. I'm going to be talking mostly geology, so no, all right? We'll see. My, my earth science is a little oxidized, so if I get something wrong here, you can email me about it later. It's steve at twickenham.org is my email. So. <laughs> if God created a world where there were no natural disasters, it would be a world without plate tectonics, thermal transfer, erosion, friction, wind, heat fluctuations, atmo atmospheric pressure differences, and many other geological and meteorological features because all of those and hundreds of other factors contribute to earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, mudslides, blizzards, and thunderstorms. Topographically, the world would, have, would be an entirely flat landscape, no mountains, no hills, no valleys, since those are created by the subduction of one tectonic plate underneath another, which pushes up mountains, but also incidentally creates earthquakes. In such a perfectly safe world, I'm not sure God could have permitted gravity. At the very least, the laws of gravity would have to be random, so that if an 80-year-old man fell, he would float instead of fall and break his hip, and that lack of predictability would wreak havoc on your space travel research. It would have to be a world where fire didn't burn, water didn't drown, and hard surfaces were not hard. Many of the things that we take for granted would just not be possible in a world absent those characteristics. Without friction, the tires on your car would never gain traction. Without variations in air pressure, the wings of an airliner would never produce lift. And without gravity, 
everything would be up in the air, so to speak. When I was, when I was in college, for one summer, I worked, well, two summers, but I worked in Pascagoula, Mississippi, right on the Gulf Coast. And the people that I lived with had crab traps all over the Gulf, uh, out in the Gulf there outside of Pascagoula. They were out there every morning going out and, and, and pulling phylum arthropoda out of these crab cages. Here's the interesting thing about crabs. Delicious, especially cooked by an old Cajun woman. They are fabulous when they're, when they're prepared. But you know what they have? They have claws. And when you reach into that cage to get that delicious crab, those claws always get you right there. Always hurts. A lot of the things that we just kind of take for granted in the world would not be the way they were if the world was perfectly, perfectly safe. But what if I told you that a perfectly safe, disaster-free world once did exist? Because a lot of Bible interpreters think that's how things were right after the beginning, before the fall of humanity and the planet to sin. In Genesis chapter 1, God pauses six times to say, that's good. And then when he finishes, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says that God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Apparently, it was even a world without predator and prey, because Genesis 1, 29 and 30 says that Adam and Eve and even the animals were given seed and fruit-bearing plants to eat instead of each other. Now, if that's how things really were at the beginning, what happened? Sin happened. When human beings violated, when we violated God's one and only command, sin was set loose in the world. Or as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. Later in Romans 8, Paul talks about how the creation itself, the world itself was subjected to what he calls the bondage to decay. Listen to this, Romans chapter 8, I'm going to begin in verse 18. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. He's looking ahead to heaven. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation, the planet, was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now, to be fair, you, you should know that not everybody agrees that this passage is referring to the planet when it talks about creation, but that is a responsible interpretation, and it, and it invites us to reconsider the power and effect of sin. I don't mean isolated acts of disobedience or rebellion. I mean sin as a force or power that has been turned loose in the world. It did not just affect Adam's and Eve's relationship with God and to each other. It affected humanity's relationship with everything, including the planet. We live as fallen people in a fallen world. That does not mean that the great Lisbon earthquake of 1755 or the terrible tornado that hit Huntsville in 1989 were God's judgment being poured out on Portugal or us, but it does suggest that choices have consequences and those consequences can be far, far, far reaching. What I'm suggesting is this, the presence of natural disasters is not the result of a mean, ignorant, impotent God, but the consequence of sin being set free to wreak havoc on the planet. Now naturally, you got to wonder if Jesus ever said anything about any of this, right? The problem of evil. In fact, he did. Luke chapter 13, he addresses both sides of the problem, moral evil and evil that results, the evil that results from the exercise of human will and the problem of natural evil. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans 
whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Apparently, there were some Galilean Jews who had been worshiping in the temple. There was some dust up between them and some Roman soldiers, and the Roman soldiers killed them so that their blood spilled on the altar and mixed with their sacrifices. Horrible abomination and an example of moral evil. Jesus answered, do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? In other words, is Augustine right? No. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Natural evil, right? We build a tower, it's good, but then it falls. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? No. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Jesus did not blame those who suffered for what had happened to them. In fact, he flatly denied that every bad thing that happens, happens because people have been bad. And he didn't try to really explain where evil comes from. He accepted evil as a fact of life and took from it a warning. Life is transient. Life is fragile. Life is frail. In view of our vulnerability, are you listening to me? In view of our vulnerability, keeping your relationship with God up to date is critical. Evil, pain, and suffering are realities that affect us all. And Christians, we must formulate and embody a response to that reality, which you did beautifully yesterday and in, in the previous weeks. Yesterday, 165 families left this place with food for Thanksgiving because of your generosity and your willingness to come here and work. That will feed around 700 people. 700 people are not going to be hungry this week because of you. That's the kind of response we have to make. We have to address the pain, suffering, and evil in the world with mercy and compassion. And at the same time, we have to faithfully hold to a high view of God as all-loving, all-knowing, and all-good. Look, some people came, claim that Christianity is irrational, is unreasonable, and is embraced only by people who possess the intelligence of a brick. I will admit that we often play into that prejudice. But I hope that what you've seen in, in, the, in the last several weeks as we've talked about this is that we don't have to be afraid of hard questions. We don't have to be intimidated by challenges to what we believe. Truth is never afraid of questions. Don't ever be afraid of questions. You guys don't ever be afraid of questions. Truth is not afraid. And faith is not some wishful optimism or irrational superstition. It can and should be intellectually rigorous. God created us to think. We are to love God not just with our hearts and souls, but with our minds. Paul called us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he told us to take every thought captive. Peter commanded us to to add to our faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. And he said to always be ready to give an answer when people ask you about the hope that you have. So we're supposed to love God with our heads too. This series has been an attempt to answer the why question. Why is there evil, pain, and suffering in the world? Next week, we're going to answer the how question. How, how do we handle it when sorrows come? Especially when they come this time of year. And it always seemed to be that, that at Thanksgiving and Christmas, that's when it's hardest to handle those problems. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Until then, let me leave you with something Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. Very powerful passage. In fact, let me invite you to stand as we hear this word of God because I want you to be blessed by it and I want you to take it with you. It's Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. What shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, 
is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is how and why we overcome. Praise God. Let's sing. Your light broke, broke through, through my night, night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up. I stand. and we will, we will call it a morning. First of all, there's a wedding shower today for Cole Swearingen and his fiancee, Kelsey Allen. That is in the Mercy Building at 1.30. Uh, no classes Wednesday night. Stay at home and be with family. We have a great week. Thanks for being here. Let's pray together as we leave. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so thankful that you were willing to send your only son to die for us. We're so thankful that his blood washes away our sins. But we're also thankful that you were so willing to do that so that you, you could reestablish a relationship with us that, that nothing, no tornadoes, no earthquakes, no mass shootings, no murders can separate us from you. We're so thankful for that passage that is so powerful that says that you're always there, that you're always there for us. We're just thankful for that, and we ask that you would help us to keep that in mind every day of our lives, that you're there, that we can't be separated from you, 
and that you've done everything for us. And we just ask us to praise you and worship you in return. Mr. Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs>